guys, my name is Chrissy. I'm one of the third year EMIMs. I want to thank Drs. Kendall, Warshaw, Berlin, Christoph, and Rogoyo, as well as Dr. Lucchese and Dr. Castle for supplying me with some of the Kings County history that I included in my presentation. Technically, social emergency medicine is a new field, or at least was recently defined. But I had this college, college professor who taught about events and movements within a frame of the long touch of history. The things don't happen spontaneously by chance, but are built within the context of a historical foundation. And I would argue that social EM isn't this entirely novel concept, but really a culmination of what is inextricably a part of the field and history of emergency medicine, especially of our department here at Kings County and Dallas. So to build this framework, we're gonna take a few steps back. I'm gonna talk about social medicine and its basic principles. From this, we'll segue into social emergency medicine, its history, different aspects, and practical applications. Finally, I wanna tie it back to us. Why is it important for us to know and how can we better incorporate social EM into our culture and our education? Social medicine as a concept emerged in the early 19th century during the Industrial Revolution with an increase, when an increase in poverty and disease, especially amongst workers, raised concerns about the effects of social processes on the health of the poor. As a field, social medicine seeks to understand how social, political, economic conditions impact health, disease, and the practice of medicine. Rudolf Virchow, who's better known as, for his work as a physician, anthropologist, and bio biologist, was also a writer and a politician, and is often credited as being the fa father of social medicine. He expressed his belief that illness is born out of a patient's social situation, and that, and that the role of physicians goes beyond the walls of the hospital, that it is our responsibility to also address the social issues that, that affect our patients. There's a lot that falls within the large umbrella of social medicine, but really it can be distilled into four basic concepts. First, the foundation of really much of social medicine is the concept that healthcare is a fundamental right. In fact, some, including the writers of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, might say that access to medical care is a Secondly, the concept that health is socially determined. This is a concept that I believe we're all familiar with, similar to the biopsychosocial model we might have been taught in medical Though I think this model equips the influence of biological, social, and physiological or uh, psychological factors, it probably is more accurately depicted like this. Things like poverty, inadequate housing, sanitation, insufficient nutrition, which we often term as social determinants of health, have profound effects on health outcomes. Public health traditionally looks at individual rather than groups as units of analysis and focuses on more specific individual characteristics such as sex, age, education, income, and race. Social medicine defines problems and seeks solutions in a greater social context. A term that I'm sure you've come across and you should be aware of is structural violence. It refers specifically to social constructs that lead to health inequities. It is structural because it is embedded and normalized in our social, political, economic, and cultural structures and it is violent because it causes direct harm to life. Paul Farmer, a more modern, modern figure within social medicine, often refers to structural violence as the root cause of health disparities and speaks a lot to our role as physicians to address them. I think a perfect yet disturbing and heartbreaking example of structural violence is the recent death. We know and saw how devastating the disease was to our community and very quickly began to see a clear pattern of who was getting this there were a lot of sources that cited the higher rates of diabetes, hypertension, et cetera, in our community as a cause of this, but in my opinion, that argument, argument falsely focuses on the individual factors and entirely ignores the big picture of the social, racial, political, and economic context that set our patients up to be so to add insult to injury, at the time we were seeing our communities disproportionately affected by the coronavirus due to the multiple structural socioeconomic disadvantages they face, we saw an inequitable allocation of resources. The, during this time, Congress passed the CARES Act that provided $175 billion in relief funds to hospitals on the front lines of the coronavirus response. Again, we saw that hospitals serving more affluent communities get a greater allocation of funding compared to say a state designated COVID center that serves a predominantly poor population 
a community that had much higher rates of infection and case fatality that got a quarter to a third of what some of these other hospitals got. So if people really want to know why our communities were so disproportionately affected by this pandemic or why they're more vulnerable to future threats, it's because our society continually divests from the exact vulnerable, disadvantaged communities that need it the most, which leads to direct harm and loss of life. This is structural violence. The third principle of social medicine is the health that the health of a population as a whole matters. Salvador Allende was a Chilean physician who proposed social rather than medical solutions to health problems. He became a, an active in politics, ser serving as a senator and a minister of health. In the 1950s, he created the Chilean National Health Service, which was actually the first program in all of the Americas to provide universal health care. Which segues us into the fourth and final principle, that social origins of illness demand social solutions. In the center of this model, you, you have the different factors from the individual genetic factors to the behavioral lifestyle factors to the built environment and social context that influence health outcomes and inequity. Traditionally in medicine, we focus on biological processes and evidence-based medicine. However, where our medical education has failed us is in teaching us how to link social analysis to everyday clinical practice. We have spent years learning about how to treat the biological causes of disease but have very little education on how to address the context, which makes our patients more vulnerable to death. Some might argue these roles don't fall within our purview, that our roles should remain within the confines of clinical practice. It's pretty obvious how I feel about it, but not too long ago when the NRA told us that we shouldn't be commenting on our country's gun policy, we as a medical community gave them a collective middle name. I don't have to tell you guys about how we see gun violence directly affect our community. I don't have to tell you guys about the chilling, that seems feeling, we get when we hear the cries of, of family members at going through their, the hallways after a trauma. This is our life. And so is racism and police brutality. So is food insecurity. So is the detention of asylum seekers. So are so many other social issues that we see directly affect our patients. So let's bring this back to our practice in specifically in the ED. We practice social medicine every day. Think about the patients you see on a daily basis, the patients brought in by EMS because they neglected their medical problems until it reaches a critical point. Those seeking refuge from cold heat and other elements are patients who come in because all they want is a bed to sleep in and a cheese sandwich. Immigrants who are undocumented, who don't have many resources, or especially those who don't speak English, who come to us because we don't know how to navigate our complicated healthcare system. While our primary goal is to stabilize and treat patients medically, I would argue that our role as emergency medicine providers is not only to understand the social context of our patients' medical problems, but to actually address them. At its roots, EM is a specialty born of societal need for equal access to medical care, regardless of socioeconomic status, immigration status, documentation status. This concept is reflected in the history of our field and especially in the history of where we work. Even before emergency medicine became a recognized specialty, and before the formal establishment of an EMS system, there was this landmark study published in 1966, commonly referred to as the White Paper, that showed that 50,000 deaths could be attributed to pre-hospital care. There were some who argued that this public health crisis disproportionately affected poor Black neighborhoods. Because at this time, before the advent of EMS, oftentimes it was Police who responded to medical emergency. And as you, as you can imagine, relationships between these neighborhoods and the police could be tense. Poor neighborhoods received little emergency care, and police even avoided responding calls to calls in some of them. So in Pittsburgh in 1967, Philip Hallen, the president of the Maurice Falk Medical Fund, which focus on, focuses on health disparities due to institutional racism, along with Jim McCoy, who ran the Freedom House Enterprises, a nonprofit that helped those in the Black community find jobs, register to vote, and organize NAACP meetings, along with Dr. Peter, Peter Safar, the father of CPR, came together and formed the Freedom House Ambulance Service. They were basically the first paramedics and pioneers of pre hospital care that was predominantly staffed by Black men and women, specific, recruiting specifically unemployed individuals from the community to provide not only more equitable care to them, but also providing economic support. 
It wasn't even until more than a decade later that emergency medicine became a recognized medical specialty. In the US. At that time, the only focus was on training physicians to treat the critically ill or injured. However, it was with the passing of EMTALA that really expanded the scope of emergency care and the role of land. EMTALA was passed in response to discrimination and barriers to seeking medical care. In a way, it was a social contract by which those who are poor, disabled, immigrants, regardless of documentation status, substance users, homeless, those who are marginalized or without resources can seek care and refuge when they have nowhere else to turn. It has by law made the ED by law the most accessible door into our healthcare system and thus acts as a social barometer of its community. It was around 2009 that we typically think of the origin of social emergency medicine and it was an establishment of the Andrew Levitt Center for Social Emergency Medicine out of Highland Hospital in Oakland, California. So it wasn't until 2017 and onwards that many of the overarching EM groups like ASAP, SAEM, and EMRA formed their own social EM chapters, really solidifying the presence of social EM as an academic field within emergency medicine. So what even is social EM and what does it actually look like? I like to think of social emergency medicine as a multifaceted approach to care. There's the best basic bedside principles, that is the education and training that allows physicians to better identify and care for individual patients with specific social, for example, doing an X waiver training. Then there's the systems-based solutions, which I generally think of as more of the clinical hospital-based solutions for addressing social needs. For example, having a food pantry, that provides food for patients straight in, out of the emergency room. Lastly, population or community-based methods, which is a much broader approach trying to address the actual social structures or context through community partnerships, grassroots organizations, advocacy, and policy change. And within social emergency medicine, there are a lot of different topics or themes, such as, but not limited to alcohol, substance use, violence, including gun or domestic, food insecurity, housing, immigration, incarceration, culture, LGBTQI, gender, race, and trafficking. The long fetch of history of Kings County Hospital and specifically our program is what we have is that we have always stood for the care of the most vulnerable and marginalized population. We were born out of necessity, and in 1831, Kings County, then called the Brooklyn Alms House, was opened. And to commemorate the 100th anniversary of Kings County being opened, the city built this entrance to the building. And behind this door is this beautiful room, and carved along the top border of the entire room in stone is this quote. Let all who serve here remember this building is dedicated by the city of New York to the care of all who are helpless and this before all else. This is the spirit of Kings County and should be what guides our daily practice. This before all else. Six decades later came the birth of our emergency department and our residency program. Dr. Lucchese tells us this story every year to the, to the interns, but I think it's worth repeating and reminding ourselves about our own history. To first set the scene, we go to what I think is the best post, Los Angeles, California in 1991. <laughs> so the beating of Rodney King, it was by far not the first actual occurrence, but perhaps the first recording of unfortunately at this point, too damn many times where an unarmed black man was brutalized at the hands of the police. As you can imagine, this had reverberating effects across the country. In the setting of that outrage that occurred with it on August 19th, 1991, Gavin Cato, a seven-year-old boy, a son of Guyanese immigrants with his cousin, Angela, playing on the side. There was a three-car motorcade escorting a rabbi from the Lubavitch Hasidic community. The last car had run a red light and was struck by another car, causing it to veer onto the sidewalk where Gavin and his cousin were playing. It hit this pillar that was knocked down, pinning Gavin Cato under it. The first ambulance to arrive at the scene was the Hoxilla Ambulance Service, who tended to the driver of the car first and took him first to, the, to Kings County. Then the city ambulance arrived and took Gavin Cato to Kings County where he was pronounced dead. For 
For three days after, there were protests and unrest in Crown Heights. On the morning of August 20th, Yankel Rosenbaum, a 29-year-old rabbinical student from Australia, was beaten and stabbed several times. He was taken to the ER at Kings County, which at the time had no separate emergency department, emergency medicine department, or residency, where he was cared for by an August PGY2 surgery resident. And unfortunately, he soon died from a misstab. There was a backlash following these incidents, and apparently there were even talks of shutting down Kings County, but they realized the need was too great. What they realized is what our community needed was a dedicated Department of Emergency Medicine. And from this need was born the first full-fledged Department of Emergency Medicine in New York City. Because while there were a number of EM residencies in New York City at that time, they were under other departments such as emergency medicine. Our department and our program was born out of racial injustice and trauma. And the tragedy of the death of Gavin Cato, his cousin Angela, and Yankel Rosen. The origins of our program was built on a need for equitable care, quality emergency care. We are Kings County Emergency Medicine. We practice social emergency medicine daily through the patients we serve and the long touch of history of our program and our institution. I think social emergency medicine is inherently part of who we are. There's already so much we are, we, we as a program and in, individuals in our part, department have done that falls within its umbrella but it should be a more formalized and structured aspect of our department and our program. There are four things I think we should focus on continuing and incorporating into our culture. First, resident education, which should focus on social determinants of health and the tools to translate theory into practice. Generally, this will provide the bedside principles to better care for our patients because the socially minded emergency provider should be informed on the many issues that affect vulnerable populations and how this may affect their presentation or their interactions with them. They are able to ask beyond just which substances a patient might be using, but about specific behaviors that might affect their risk for things like overdose or disease. Beyond that, they are well informed in harm reduction and motivational interviewing that may lead to better outcomes for that patient. They see that trauma and violence are directly linked to the community and use a trauma informed approach to care to mitigate retaliation, and recidivism. They understand the conditions that homeless patients live in and the barriers they face. They might understand the state of immigration law and use their position as a physician to help refugees seeking asylum. Later this month, we'll actually have a guest speaker, Dr. Murakami, speak about asylum medicine and his work with PHR Asylum Clinic. They understand the specific barriers to care of transgender patients. And as Dr. Dada's great presentation on racism in medicine and the mistrust of the healthcare system shows, it is important to us, for us to understand and address these issues deeply rooted in history that affect how our patients seek care. We hope to train residents to be these socially minded providers through multiple means. This year, we already made a huge step by Dr. Willis, our APDs, and our chief, Dr. Sherifelli, incorporating a social EM curriculum into our conference didactic. Last year, Dr. Warshaw and I, with the guidance of Dr. Kendall, started the Social EM Mini Fellowship, which we hope continues to grow and gain some traction. And something we've talked about and would love to start is an elective where residents interested in social EM topics could use time to fo focus on socially framed research and interventions. Another aspect is advocacy. As physicians, we should use our political voice and position in society to improve the social conditions our patients and this generally focuses on the population or community-based methods in which in actually trying to address the conditions and social context that lead to health. This is something that is a strength of our residents in our program. I am continually inspired and proud to work alongside you day after day. I've seen fiercely advocate for your patients, whether it's in the clinical setting where you're fighting for the best care for your patients, even if that means you have to yell at two consult consultants simultaneously to come see a patient you're worried about, providing our patients compassionate care, or even the simple gestures of kindness you show. As physicians, we also bear witness to the suffering of our patients, and carrying on these narratives and experiences can inform care and interventions. Recently, a couple of our residents, like Dr. Anthony and Desai, have, public have been publishing these narratives. Lastly, I have never known you to be the type of people to stand by silently while there is injustice. And our, recently, our residency, our program directors, and our department leadership didn't hesitate to stand up and publicly proclaim Black Lives Matter. 
There are a few aspects as it pertains to social EM I think we as a program could continue to build upon, such as community outreach and interventions. Medicine has trended towards physicians working within the confines of a hospital, but we shouldn't forget that to really understand and better serve our patients, we need to know where they're coming from. We need to go to the people. We should meet our community members outside of the clinical setting to form partnerships with them. These concepts address both systems-based solutions by creating interventions that can address the social needs of patients, but also by reaching, out, by, by reaching out to the community and forming partnerships, we could potentially even improve social conditions and the context that brings them to us in the place. The perfect example of these concepts is Copy, a program that is actually celebrated and cited in a lot of social EM sources as a prime example of what social EM can Kavi intervenes in the hospital by directly identifying victims of violence when they present to our EPT, but they also do a lot of outreach in the community to address the underlying conditions that lead to that violence. Lastly, research is a powerful tool in social EM too, just like in any other aspect of medicine. Rather than the ED just becoming a place for people who have nowhere else to turn, through research, it could possibly potentially be a social surveillance system to highlight where the needs are and help guide the design of more effective interventions. <clears throat> so to summarize, there are four basic principles of social medicine, that healthcare is a fundamental right, health is socially determined, population health matters, and social origins of illness demand social solutions. Structural violence is structural because it is embedded and normalized in our society, and it is violent because it causes direct harm and loss of life. Social EM is a multifaceted approach from bedside principles to guide direct patient care to systems based solutions that provide for the social needs of our patients to population based methods to address the underlying social conditions. Finally, we practice social emergency medicine here daily. We have always been fierce advocates for our patients and have already taken steps to expand our resident education. However, we can and should improve upon community outreach, interventions such as COVID, and research about the social conditions that affect our own patients and how we can more effectively address them. I just want to leave you with this quote, literally. <laughs> Questions? Mm. <laughs> Chrissy, I thought that was great and kind of a good overview so that later on we have a, like a frame of reference for our goals for this lecture series um, and just a reminder of our day to day interactions with our patients and our. Goals. I love that quote from county. Yeah, yeah, that was Dr. Hassel's recommendation. <laughs>